Hello everyone, welcome to another special episode of the Podcast Boys. I am the Comics Kid 2099 and I am joined by my co-host Connor Nielsen. Connor, how are you doing today? I'm doing excellently. How are you doing, Comics Kid? I'm doing very well myself. Uh, so we finished talking about Twin Peaks, the series. We did a couple of special episodes talking about favorite characters, favorite episodes, and then we did our proposal for uh, our own Imagine Season 3s. And uh, I came up with an idea uh, where we could talk about different episodes or movies uh, from various franchises across fiction uh, where different actors from Twin Peaks are in an episode or in a movie. Uh, and this is different anything. Uh, for example, today we are going to be talking about an episode of The X-Files. It has uh, Michael Horse in it. Michael Horse played one of our favorite characters, Hawk, in Twin Peaks. Uh, this episode is uh, Season 1, Episode 19. Uh, the episode is called Shapes. And uh, this is going to be the format of the Podcast Boys for a little while until we have something substantial to talk about uh, for the revival. Uh, so, Connor... Uh, Briefly, what uh, is the premise of this episode uh, that we watched? So, I've never seen an episode of The Twilight Zone, but I do know the premise of the show. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Fox Mulder, played by David Duchovny, and Dana Scully? Yeah. Uh, yeah, she's played by Gillian Anderson, and they play... Yeah, so, so, they're a couple of uh, members of the FBI, and they get called in to do a job in... What's it called? Uh, it's Butte, Montana, mm -hmm. up in the good old Northwest very similar locale to Twin Peaks, and uh, they're on a uh, Native American reservation in close proximity to the edge where there's a cattle rancher and his son, and there's also, uh, well, hold on, one, one of the people, okay, so <laughs> it's actually a more complicated than I thought it was, okay, just explaining off the top of your head, so there's a, a murder, what happens is the cattle rancher shoots what he thinks is a wolf man that's attacking his son. And then it's revealed that he didn't shoot a wolf man, he shot a person. And that person was a man who lived on the Native American reservation. So the FBI is coming in to investigate it, and they have to deal with uh, a recent loss in the Native American community. And then they also have to deal with some uh, resentment from the Native American community because the FBI is never really around when you know they need them. But whenever someone else gets shot, you know they're the ones who get put under a microscope. But uh, the Wolfman murders start continuing, and uh, they have to figure out what is going on. Comics Kid, I know you're a huge X-Files fan, so why don't you tell us <laughs> all about this episode and what you thought of it? Well, uh, Connor is being just a little bit sarcastic there. Uh, I was not a huge fan of the X-Files, uh, but really a lot of my uh, anger towards this series is the fact that it sets up all of these big, long-running questions, and it sets up this huge mythos, but then it never actually does anything to pay off those questions or actually resolve any of the mythos stuff that it sets up. Uh, this episode is what they would call the Monster of the Week episode. Uh, it has nothing to do with Mulder's uh, kidnapped sister or the cigarette-smoking man trying to uh, block their efforts to uh, find the truth. Uh, it has nothing to do with any of that. So just watching an episode like this by itself, uh, it's a lot more tolerable than when you're watching the entire series back-to-back -back like I did. Um, now, I still have minor issues with the premise of this series that come up in this episode, but I enjoyed this episode just by itself. Uh, and I had that experience with many episodes that were Monster of the Week episodes uh, when you watch them by themselves and you take them as a unit unto their own. Uh, but when you try and take it as part of a larger whole, uh, it becomes a little bit more problematic. Uh, but I enjoyed this episode. Um, it reminded me a lot, uh, when we talked about Twin Peaks, we would talk about uh, local law enforcement confronting uh, federal agents. Uh, we had a little bit of that in the pilot episode of Twin Peaks when uh, Cooper said, listen, I'm in charge. Uh, I've had instances before where the local law enforcement, they can't get that through their heads, and then we have problems down the line. And then he and Harry, they work swimmingly together. Uh, but then you have Harry, he has a confrontation with Al, and then that doesn't work out too well for Harry or Al. And then uh, in Fire Walk With Me, you have Chris Isaac having a confrontation with uh, the sheriff of Deerfield. Uh, and this has a little bit of that going on here. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, I don't feel like I'm 100% on either side here. I'm not really on Fox or Dana's side, nor am I really on uh, the local laws side either. I feel like I can see both sides here of this little argument that they have going on. Um, and I really like Michael Horse here. 
uh, I wasn't sure what you were going to think of this because I watched this episode. Uh, I, this is, I think, the third time that I've seen this episode. Uh, I saw it years and years ago once when I saw uh, the X-Files Season 1. And then uh, much more recently, I watched the entire X-Files series. And then I watched this episode uh, a few days ago for this podcast. And I wasn't sure what Connor was going to think of this episode because while Michael Horse is in it and he's the reason that we watched this episode, he's not the main character of the episode. Um, so I wasn't sure uh, what you were going to think of there being uh, as much Michael Horse as there was. But I really enjoyed him. Uh, I liked uh, – he's basically – uh, he's a, he comes off as a little bit uh, unreasonable when he doesn't let them uh, do an autopsy on the first werewolf body that they find. He comes off a little jerkish at that point, but then uh, I can kind of see where he's coming from. When he says, uh, you get to leave in a few days, I have to stay here and I have to deal with these people. Uh, I really liked him in this episode. Connor, what did you think of this episode as someone who has never watched The X-Files before? Uh, how did you view this experience? It was a very interesting experience, mostly just how fascinating it was from a cultural and historical standpoint, uh, seeing it uh, even maybe even a little bit more so than, say, Twin Peaks, because Twin Peaks was really popular for like a hot second, and then it went away really fast. Um, and it's really interesting seeing this as a progression on something like Twin Peaks, because it's obvious this was inspired by that. Um, yeah. Even like stuff like the, the way it looks. Even like maybe it's just this episode specifically, but there's that northwest uh, misty mountains aesthetic that's really neat. Um, but when Twin Peaks was around, we say it was ahead of its time because it took episodes and episodes and episodes before you finally found out who killed Laura Palmer. And this one, it is as you had said, a monster of the week episode. So it's almost a more of an instant gratification where you're invested for an hour and you get your resolution. And uh, I think that's really interesting. And it's also interesting interesting to see how something like this would turn into something like. NCIS or CSI or something, and that's and I think that's really interesting, um, seeing how it all progressed and how this went on for nine whole seasons, and this is a first episode. Sorry, this is an episode in the first season. I think that's really interesting. Um, as for this episode in particular, it's adequate. <laughs> um, I think that the weakest thing about this is maybe the script. Not to say I think it's particularly bad. I think there's some holes in here. Um, I know you talk about. Uh, Dana Scully being like maddening because she just refuses to believe when she has irrefutable evidence. And I think you just watching one episode, I'm like, wow, I can't imagine watching like <laughs> seven seasons of this. <laughs> um, but the best thing about this, I think is the production design production values. I think this is a very good looking and well-produced show. And also I think Michael Horace is a standout here. I think he's awesome. I have a God bless you Hawk moment for this episode. Maybe even two. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a God bless you Hawk moment also. I was thinking we would both have one. Uh, what was your God bless you Hawk moment? Oh, it's the end with the shotgun. How could yeah. you not? <laughs> yep. Uh, I, I really like the moment. Uh, it, it's not necessarily his moment. Uh, mine was the shotgun moment also. But uh, whenever Michael Horse's character and the old wise man and Mulder are all talking about uh, this town's history with the wolf people, um, the old wise man says to Mulder, uh, you have an open mind even more than – or he says your mind is open to Native American stuff even more than some Native Americans. And he looks at Michael Horse's character, and Michael Horse just kind of like looks away like, yeah, guilty. That's me. Uh, I really <laughs> like his character in this episode. Um, I am really kind of sad that this actor hasn't gotten to do more leading man stuff because I think this episode – he really shined here, and watching this episode, I was thinking that just the plot of this one episode would have been really cool to have seen as, like, a miniseries. Like, a 12 or 13 episode miniseries on Netflix where there's a werewolf attack in this town, and you've got these two families that are at war with each other because of a land dispute. And then you've got this sheriff who is a Native American himself, but he's trying to do things by the book, and all the Native Americans, they hate him because he's – pretty much a white man who is a Native American. Like, all of that is really fascinating, and I would have really loved to have seen all of that be more explored thoroughly and not just as a one-off episode in this series. Yeah, would, yeah. oh my god, okay. Hawk, he's uh, taking some leave off of Twin Peaks. Mm -hmm. Gotta go visit some family, so he goes off the reservation. And, uh, yeah, it'd be, oh, I think, yeah, great, great six-issue mini-series or six-episode mini-series on Netflix. This is great, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I uh, I actually had it in my headcanon that uh, Hawk uh, moved from Twin Peaks to Roswell, New Mexico, 
uh, because there was a TV series in the 2000s called Roswell. Uh, it was absolutely horrible. Everything I saw about it just looked amazingly awful. Uh, it was like Smallville, but without all of the cool Superman stuff that you like. Um, <laughs> and it was about these three alien kids uh, who are trying to blend into human society. And the deputy in this town was Michael Horse. And he's only in like maybe two or three episodes of that series, and he never gets anything to do. Uh, I was tempted to pick one of those episodes for this podcast series, but I don't think I will because he doesn't really get to do a whole lot. But, uh, yeah, that was like, for a while I was thinking, that's definitely like Hawk moved from Twin Peaks to Roswell just to, like, start a new life. And it, it was really cool to see, like, two Twin Peaks alums, like, on screen together. I, I, uh, David E. Coveney, of course, played Denise Bryson in uh, – the uh, second season of Twin Peaks, and I was I was really cool that I thought it was cool that Michael Horse had a lot to do in this episode. He had more, like a little bit more than I thought he would. I thought he would just be the sheriff who shows up at the beginning saying, "You people can't do this," and then at the end he goes, "Hey, you guys did it. Good job." I thought that would be the he'd be like a Scooby Doo character almost, mm-hmm. but he wasn't, and I like that. Yeah, uh, I really enjoyed his character, and like I said, I wish we could have had more of this particular episode just stretched out a little bit. I really liked how, and I think I may have already said this already, but you've got this little dispute between Mulder and the sheriff, and it's not a one-sided dispute where you side with one or the other. Uh, Mulder comes to town, and him and Scully, they want to solve this mystery, and this guy won't let them uh, do an autopsy on the body. And at first you're thinking, well, he's being really unreasonable, but then you're thinking, well, he has to answer to these people. Uh, He has a really great moment where he says, you guys are going to leave in a few days. I have to stay here, and I have to deal with them forever. Uh, And I really like his rationale for only letting them go so far in their investigation. But then when the time comes, he's not going to hinder them. Kind of like in Fire Walk With Me, uh, where you've got the Deerfield police. They are doing everything they can to make sure that Chris Isaac can't do his job. This guy, he doesn't like that Mulder and Scully are coming in on his turf, but at the same time, he's going to try and help them so at the very least, so that he, he can get them out of here. Uh, and I really like that. Uh, he was a very complex character, and for the amount of screen time that he gets, he does wonders with what he's given. I, I agree. There's a couple... I, I want to get a little bit more into the weird uh, things that kind of pop up. Uh, there's, like, an interesting shift, in, like like a pendulum that swings in television, mm-hmm. where where something just doesn't take enough time versus something that is just too decompressed. Yeah. Um, and... I, I, people would argue that like Twin Peaks is too decompressed, right? Uh, it takes too long to get to where it's going, yada, 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 whatever. Um, but then you have stuff like the CSI and stuff that it was so episodic and just so um, open and shut, open and shut, that when we got back to stuff like Breaking Bad where it was more decompressed and it was like a telenovela almost, right, where it was just like – it was like a novel on screen, then it was kind of a cool organic way to just explore everything and it was a good – way to get back away from uh, network television. And then we have, then now uh, I see a lot of people complaining that maybe some shows are just too decompressed. Um, a lot of people applaud, like when Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. will just like wrap up a story arc in like two episodes as opposed to like dragging it out for 14 episodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, um, I don't know where I was going with this, but yeah, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I can kind of see where you're going with that, though, because like with the X-Files, on the one hand, you have mysteries that raged for a decade and were never solved, and then you have episodes like this where you introduce all of the elements and then you conclude all of those elements in one episode. And uh, this is one of those instances where I kind of would have liked to have seen a little bit more, uh, and the X-Files excelled at that. Uh, anytime you're interested in something and you want to see them do more with it, that's going to be one of the Monster of the Week episodes where you're never going to see those characters or concepts again. But then if it's something that you don't really care about, then you can be pretty sure they're going to drag it out a little bit longer. Uh, but yeah. So at the end of this episode, the one guy says, hey, FBI, I'll see you in eight years. Do you ever see them? Uh, do you ever see this place again in season nine? No, unfortunately. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's what – well, and like he says that. He says, I'll see you in eight years. And I thought that was a little weird because I was keeping a, a close ear out for that. Uh, they're talking about how it's periodically that we see the wolf people, but at no point do they say that this happens every eight years, do they? No, um, they said about every eight years, okay, give or take. Um, and so I, I, I mean, I, I figured it was just a little quip that they oh, throw okay. at the end, like, oh, see you in eight years, shucks, yeah. all shucks. But then if it actually did happen eight years later, that'd be a nice return. Who yeah, doesn't love Michael been. Horse? Because like they did, they did an episode with this weird guy who could he ate the bile from livers, and he was semi-immortal, and he would come back every thirty years. And then they did a follow-up episode to that, 
And so you're thinking, if they do a follow-up episode to that guy, why not do a follow-up episode to this? But I guess maybe they were thinking they'd already done a werewolf episode and there wasn't anything else they could do. Um, but, uh, yeah, I because at one point he said, like, there, there was a werewolf case in the 50s, and then he jumped to the 70s. And I was thinking, okay, so there's not really any rhyme or reason to it. And that was something that, if you're really wanting to nitpick stuff, you could say that the science behind this werewolf stuff going on here doesn't really make a lot of sense. Like, what is it that triggers a werewolf transformation. Why does it happen only every eight years or whenever? Um, but that didn't really bother me. Um, you would think that since I'm the big anti-X-Files guy, that I would be, like, searching and scrutinizing for something to complain about. But having a lack of scientific uh, explanation for the how and why of the werewolf stuff, that didn't really bother me because I was so enthralled by having a little mini werewolf movie uh, on screen. I, I thought that uh, all the transformation stuff was really cool. Uh, getting to see, like, the loose skin on the ground. At one point, Mulder sees a human face, like, skin from a human face on the ground. Uh, that was really creepy and awesome. Uh, then getting to see, spoilers, uh, the rancher's son transform into uh, the werewolf uh, in the bathroom. That was really cool. So, like, all of that superseded any complaints I might have about, well, this doesn't make any sense. Why is this? <laughs> and I think uh, the like a Native American twist on the werewolf is such a cool concept that we don't see. And I think that um, Native American culture in general is something I wish we saw more of in entertainment mm -hmm. because it is a really unique, because, I mean, it's the land we live on, right? Right. <laughs> like, so this kind of ancient stuff on the land we live on, that's really interesting because usually what we get is, oh, it's an ancient Indian burial ground. The end. Like, yeah. No, like, that, that's usually what we get in, like, these like scary movies that have any kind of Native American twist to them. But this is something else, and... I like that, and uh, I, I, to your point about the werewolf transformation scene, it's so cool. Mm -hmm. It's maybe the best TV transformation I've seen. The part where the you see the werewolf arm breaking through the human skin is so, like I didn't expect to see that on like a network television show from the '90s. And even like the stuff at the end where they're like walking through the dark, empty house, it's it's so well directed that I'll even excuse how formulaic it is. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, they're walking through the dark thing, and I, there's a difference between going to a movie and watching this in a theater and oh my gosh, this is a werewolf episode on TV. Like, there's a bit of, it's more novel than it is, say, like, in a, in a movie, and I, and I like that. Yeah, and um, I will say that, uh, getting back to your point on uh, Native American, uh, I don't want to say mythology, but uh, representation of Native Americans in uh, television and movies and stuff, I agree. Uh, I think we should see more of it. In this particular case, I wasn't sure how I felt about it because uh, at times it felt like it was, I don't want to say racist, but it felt like something that a white dude made up and put into this story and said, well, this is how the Native Americans treat death. Uh, like there's one part where uh, the dead werewolf guy, his sister says, it's our custom to give away all of the belongings of the dead to somebody. So then she gives some stuff to Scully and she says uh, he had more belongings than he did friends. And that's a really great line. Uh, but yeah. it's one of those things where I was watching it and I was thinking, that sounds very Hollywood. That doesn't sound like an authentic <laughs> part of Native American culture. And of course, to try and homogenize all Native Americans into one culture, that would be a mistake because there's many <laughs> different cultures. Uh, and I don't even think that they get into specifics on which tribe this is, uh, if I'm not mistaken. They just kind of say, it's in Montana, but uh, did they specify which tribe this was? I didn't hear anything, and I kind of like that ambiguity. Yeah, uh, it gives them a little bit of freedom. They don't have to say, well, since, you know, if we're going to say that they're Apache, then we have to stick to Apache myths and legends from history. Uh, it gives them a little bit of freedom, but at the same time, it also makes it seem like, okay, they're just generic Native Americans. Uh, and yeah, that's I, true. I was, I mean, I enjoyed this episode quite a bit, and I, like you, I really like the idea of werewolfism is a Native American thing. Uh, there was an episode of Smallville that did something kind of like that, and say what you will about Smallville, uh, I really like that episode too. Uh, but uh, this is, and it also committed some of the same sins that I feel like this episode commits. Uh, but I guess where I'm coming down on this is, while I enjoyed this episode, uh, I feel like this almost feels like something that Hollywood is presenting as, air quotes, authentic Native American stuff. Uh, and I'm curious if we would have gotten the same kind of episode if they had done a little bit more research or if they had gotten a uh, uh, someone who is more familiar with Native American uh, lore uh, as a consultant on this episode. Uh, but Yeah, I was going to say, like, they have a lot of Native American actors, which, by the way, uh, I, I think they're all giving a really good performance. I, I, I haven't mm -hmm. seen any of these actors uh, except for Michael Horse or anything else, but – I uh I, I would be I'd be interested to see how, if they had any input on like the script or right. anything because I think that would be cool. 
Yeah, that would have made a lot of sense, and maybe this would have felt, and I hesitate to use the word racist because I don't think that it's intentionally racist, but I think sometimes, like, like there's that scene where they're doing the funeral, and the medicine man, he's kind of chanting, and he's kind of moving around, and I was looking at that and thinking, is that really something that Native Americans in this area of the world would do, or is that something that Hollywood has invented? And I wasn't sure, um, and it didn't bother me as much as I guess I'm letting it on, uh, since uh, we're talking about it so much. It didn't bother me as much as it sounds, but uh, it is something that I felt like was worth noting. Yeah, and, and, and it's it's almost so innocent that you can't, like, get mad at it. Right. Because <laughs> um, this is the 90s. This might have been, like, like a super progressive sort of thing, but I, I, I don't know. It, it, you are right. It is something that I personally didn't really uh, – that, that, is, that is definitely worth noting. I don't know if it's, like – a very important thing. It's not necessarily like this episode lives or dies by its representation of that. Right, right. Um, I do think that this episode has a lot of archetypes, and in some cases that works. In other cases, I think that they could have tried a little harder. Uh, you've got the uh, discount Sam Elliott, who uh, he shoots the werewolf at the beginning of the episode, and he's basically just the white guy who has taken some land from the Native Americans, and he's having a dispute with them. And his character doesn't really evolve beyond that. Uh, you would think that uh, he would have had more to do. Uh, spoilers, he gets killed before he really gets to do anything else. And then uh, the wise old man who tells Mulder about werewolves in the past, he doesn't really get to do anything else. Um, he has a good line uh, whenever he's talking about uh, how Mulder uh, seems more open to Native American ideas than some Native Americans. That was a really good line, and it cuts to Michael Horse's character. But he's still, at the end of the day, the wise old man who imparts knowledge and wisdom. Uh, but then some of the archetypes, I think, work really well, and maybe they're the ones that aren't quite as archetypical. Yeah. Um, I, I, for one, really like the son. Yeah, yeah, um, the, the rancher's son, yeah. Yeah, and uh, the, 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 the sister of the deceased dude uh, from the beginning, I thought I wouldn't like her character, but when she's talking about how she saw Diet Sam Elliott get slaughtered, I was <laughs> like, wow, that's like that was actually a really good scene. And I actually, the scene where they're in the the wise old man's hut and he's getting, you know, he's imparting knowledge. Like, yeah, there's, there's like a bit of like a pulpy nature to it, but it worked. Like, I, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I have a, I have a real soft spot for kind of pulpy, uh, classic kind of situations. Yeah. Uh, and, and like, you know, being in the hut with all the smoke and they're imparting knowledge. Yeah. You could read into like how, you know, I, I I'm sure there's like papers written about how, Oh, this is cultural appropriation or all that. But I don't think it, it has any malice in its heart towards it. It's just trying to make a fun throwback to something that's uh, kind of pulpy. And, yeah. um, and, I, and I think that works. And then the following scene with this is what I really liked. And uh, I thought I wouldn't like that character, but I ended up really liking her. And um, you, I don't know if you mentioned this, but I, I remember you had said that um, uh, you felt like there might have been like a Montague and Capulet kind of rivalry between these two and that maybe the son and the, the sister, they had like been – almost like a Romeo and Juliet sort of thing where there was a big land dispute, but they fell in love at one point. That was, I, I didn't pick up on that, but I think that that's a, but that is an interesting dynamic that you can read into. And like, it's not like anything in this episode, it, like it specifically contradicts that. So I was, I was mostly picking up on it at the funeral uh, when he comes to the funeral and he's like off in the yeah. distance trying to watch the funeral, but not in, intrude. And then she comes and she starts yelling at him. And then Michael Horse says, yeah, you better leave. And he's like, reluctantly, he leaves, but he doesn't want to. I kind of got the feeling that there was history between them. And it could be, like you were saying, you know, did they allow the actors on the set to kind of give their input on the script? That could just be a thing that the actors are bringing to that scene and not necessarily something that was in the script. Uh, because, yeah, I uh, agree. you know, this is a, a story that they weren't planning on following up on later. Uh, so maybe the writers didn't have any reason to give these two a previous chemistry together. But I thought that it was there, but at the same time, you can also read it in a way where it's not there or you don't necessarily see it. Um, but I agree with you. I like the sister character. She starts off being very abrasive. Uh, she is yelling at everybody, yelling at the sheriff, yelling at Mulder and Scully. But as the episode goes on, you realize she kind of has good reason uh, because her brother has been murdered. And then the only two people who seem interested in investigating that death seem to be investigating it because they think that there's a werewolf in town, not because her brother has been murdered. So, like, she is angry and bitter but she has just cause to be angry and bitter uh so yeah i agree i like her character a lot too um and it's another one of those things where i wish that this could have been like a six or seven episode miniseries uh and i think if x-files season one was airing today 
I think that there's a good chance, instead of this being just a one-off episode of The X-Files, that whoever came up with this would have said, hang on a second, there's more to this than just one episode. Maybe we could make this be more. And this would be like Stranger Things or one of the Netflix originals, you know, something that you'd see a lot more of. Right. Um, um, go ahead. I, I want to talk about uh, Scully because I think she does some really stupid, stupid things. Yes. Two in particular, um, but the one that, like, the, the unforgivable one is at the end where she's like, uh, the mountain lion broke out. Yeah, the mountain lion's still in the cage. Then I wonder what happened. <laughs> Wait, really? Because cool. it seems pretty open and shut. You guys are talking about Werewolf Man, and you saw, like, a freaking furry arm break through a door. Yeah. I, it, it doesn't seem all that ambiguous to me. <laughs> uh, at the beginning of the episode, whenever Mulder opens uh, the dead guy's mouth and he's got werewolf things, like, there's no doubt about it, they are werewolf things, and she says... Well, calcium deposits could sometimes account for, and I'm thinking, shut up, Scully. That is not a <laughs> calcium deposit. That is werewolf fangs. And uh, there's one other point in the episode where uh, she says something or Mulder says something, and oh, yeah, yeah, lycanthropy. Uh, whenever uh, Mul <laughs> Mulder is telling her about how for 200 years there have been sightings of werewolves, how Lewis and Clark, they wrote down in this particular area of the world there were werewolves, and she says there's this thing called lycanthropy where somebody believes that they are a werewolf. I paused the TV, and I looked toward my dad, and I said, that does not explain how Lewis and Clark saw werewolves. If you think that you are a werewolf, and I see you transform into a werewolf, then that is not lycanthropy. That's actual werewolfism. And Scully, <laughs> like, you, like you're getting at, she is the kind of character who, she has irrefutable evidence that something is going on, but because she is the skeptic, and that's how the series needs her to be, she will just ignore it. And then the next episode, she goes back to not believing in anything. That's yeah, I, I can't imagine watching that for seasons on. That's that's crazy to me because people generally believe something when they have an experience with something. Yeah. Um, uh, like a good example is like a, a legislator who is against say, same sex marriage or something, and then their brother will come out as like gay or something, and then they all of a sudden have a different perspective than they did a day ago. So now they're kind of. Uh, no longer against it so mm -hmm. and it's like i'm against where uh, van, uh well werewolfism i don't believe in it it's not real um i saw it oh yeah i still don't believe it that doesn't really click at all it doesn't make any sense yeah and I, I know i keep coming back to this i'm beating a dead horse here uh not to be confused with michael horse uh but uh <laughs> you know if this was like a netflix miniseries and you had the fbi agent who comes to town and they're a skeptic and they're just investigating a murder, and they don't believe in werewolves. But by the end of eight episodes, it's like, I've seen some stuff. I used to not believe, but now I believe. Uh, that could have worked. That could have been a really interesting arc to play out. But uh, this series was really interested in exploring the strange and unusual, but not allowing their characters to grow and change as a result of those explorations. And I think if this series was happening today, it might be handled differently. But then again, we had the X-Files revival earlier this year, and it didn't really do anything different than this series. So uh, who knows if they would do it different if they were doing it today. And and if, how I would tackle it is maybe she doesn't believe in aliens or ghosts and goblins, but she believes in werewolves at least. Yeah, yeah. And, well, you know, I guess, uh, are you uh, ever planning on watching this series? Eventually, but maybe not. Okay, well, at the end of this season, they have something else happen where it's like, okay, that seems like the definitive moment where she should stop being the skeptic. And uh, I remember I did a video a long time ago where I was saying, like, if I was doing this series, what would I have done differently? The big thing I would have done would be season one, it's okay for Scully to be the skeptic. And then, like, every now and then she has an episode where it's like, okay, I don't believe in aliens, Mulder, but I do believe in vampires or I do believe in werewolves or whatever. Um, but then at the end of the season, that should have been the moment where she should have said, okay, I believe now. And then they are kind of more on common ground. But they held their uh, – they kind of were treading water for – a really long time, and it was season seven before uh, they got rid of Mulder and they transformed Scully into the uh, skeptic. Uh, but that was what, something that it irritated me a lot when I was watching the series through. It was much less irritating when I was just watching one episode like this. I see. And maybe this is something that's to be watched week by week. I don't know if it'll improve a lot of it, but binge-watching it may not be the best thing to do with X-Files. I think you're right. Yeah, definitely. Uh... That's all I had to say about this episode. What did did you have anything else to say about this particular episode? Not particularly. It's a very interesting thing because we could go on like hours and hours and hours about uh, episodes of Twin Peaks, but we were also watching that in order, and you know certain things would build on other things, so we'd have more uh, 
things to say about those things. I said things way too many times just then, but, <laughs> um, but do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, so it is a very, very interesting discussion format to like go in an episode. So these might be a little bit more bite sized than usual, but it is, I, I don't really have a whole lot more to say about it. Uh, I think that the mystery element is a little flimsy because I was able to guess it pretty early on. Okay, um, it's, it's the brother, sorry, it's the son of the cattle rancher because he got scratched and the one other dude had scratches. So that's, that's what it's going to be. And then for a second, it was like, oh, my gosh, it's actually the sister because of uh, blood. And I went, oh, wow, I genuinely wasn't expecting that. But that's a really good twist. Oh, wait, no. It, it, it yeah. Is the that's like, and I'm not going to get on a show, like, you know, a show or anything because... I could guess it. I think that's a stupid thing to do. Yeah. But um, I, I do think that the the mystery element, if they really wanted it to be a better mystery, and it is only one episode, they probably saw this as more of like a bottle episode, open and shut. I mean, it doesn't need to be a complicated mystery. You just kind of got the thing, then the thing thing, and then we got we got some evidence, and then oh no, twist. All right, close. Put it away. Um, it's probably more of that than we have to really think through every single thing about this mystery, make it an Agatha Christie like novel. We got we got to make this as dense as we possibly can. They're not doing it that, that way. They're just trying to make a, a fun little mystery. And I think as a little mystery, it's fine. Uh, characters, I, I think where this really shines, though, is in the production. Definitely. And uh, I think that uh, it kind of reminds me of something uh, Paul Dini said about doing mysteries for uh, the DC Animated Universe. In, uh, I think he was talking about Batman Beyond. He said that he hated doing the mystery episodes because in such a short amount of time, pretty much there's only two possible people who could be the culprit. And it's not, it's not going to be the person that you think it's going to be uh, because it, that would be too easy. So then it ends up being the other person. And it's kind of like that here where it's like you only have two possible options and they're pretty heavily leaning in the direction that it ends up being. Uh, but I think that you're right. It could have been a little bit of a better mystery, but I'm not going to fault the episode for that because it does quite a bit of other stuff that I really like. I agree. Um, have you ever watched The Office? Uh, yeah, some. I like the part where uh, they're playing a mystery game and uh, Dwight goes, all right, it's never the person you most suspect. It's also <laughs> never the person you least suspect. So I am so I know that the real uh, murderer is the person that's in the middle of what I expect. <laughs> so, <laughs> is, that, um, is that the same episode where Creed comes in late and uh, Michael says, Sir, there's been a murder, and you are a suspect. And then Creed peel, <laughs> peels out of the parking lot. <laughs> that's it is, of, yeah, it's that episode. <laughs> that's one of my favorite Creed moments. Um, yeah, I love Creed. He's the great. Um, but yeah, I don't have a whole lot else to say about this. Well, uh, that's all that we have about this particular episode. But uh, Connor, do you have a choice? Since uh, I chose this episode of the Podcast Boys talking about X-Files, do you have something for us to talk about the next time we join forces to talk? I do. But uh, very quickly, I don't think we've even mentioned what this episode's called. It, it's uh, Season Shapes. 1, Episode 19, Shapes. Yeah. So... Yeah, yep. that's a there pretty good. That's a pretty good title episode, I think. Uh, you know, shape, I like it. Yeah, shape shifting. Yeah. Um, your what is your choice for uh, the next time? Um, the next time. See what I did there with X Files. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Um, but I, I I had to do a bit of a flip of a coin. But because I found out you've never seen this movie, uh. and it's my favorite comedy movie ever, and we both hate Donna Hayward and Twin Peaks, <laughs> I'm gonna go with. Wayne's World, 1992, I believe. So this was right after Twin Peaks. 92 or 93, I, I, one of the two. Um, but it stars Mike Myers and Dana Carvey. It is a feature film based off of the uh, SNL sketch. Um, it is absolutely hilarious. And uh, Lara Flynn Boyle has a decent-sized part in it. Uh, she's, she's pretty funny in this. So, yeah, it's on Netflix, I believe. I, I think it's still on Netflix. Maybe I'm wrong. But, I mean, it's... it's Wayne's World is one of the easiest movies to get your hands on. So, right. uh, yeah. Uh, Wayne's World. we got to talk about it. It's the best. Tubular. Uh, I think that's something they say in that movie, right? What's that? A tubular? Far Out? No! Uh, <laughs> it's not. Oh. oh, my God. I can't wait for you to watch this movie. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, when, when Connor Sorry. told me that she was in that movie, I was like, oh, that sounds awesome. Um, uh, so we will talk about Wayne's World in our next episode of the Podcast Boys, and it's possible that that will be a longer podcast because we'll be talking about a full-length movie, but uh, that'll be fun. Uh, so in the meantime, I am the Comics Kid 2099. And I am Connor Nielsen. 